Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2013 BioRed Proteon webinar series. I am Ruben Luo, the product manager of the BioRed Proteon product line. Today we will have our second webinar in this year's series. We are honored to have Dr. Emiliano Biasini as our speaker. Dr. Biasini is currently a research instructor in the Department of Biochemistry at Boston University School of Medicine. He has many years of experience in the research field of neurodegeneration. Dr. Biasini obtained his Italian laurea in biological sciences in 2000 at the University of Lomatry, Rome, Italy. After spending one year as a research trainee at the hospital Frederick Yolliot, also in France, he joined the lab of Dr. Roberto Giesa at the Mario Negri Institute in Milan as a PhD student. In 2004, he received his PhD with honors and a specialization in applied genetics from La Sapienza University in Rome. Between 2005 and 2007, sponsored by a fellowship from the Italian Telephone Foundation, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. David Harris, a renowned expert in the field of prion diseases at Washington University at St. Louis, USA. He returned to Italy in 2008, sponsored by a fellowship from Mario Negri Foundation. In 2010, he was recruited as a junior faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry at Boston University. In Boston, Dr. Biasini has been leading research projects aimed to elucidate the role of the cellular prion protein in several neurodegenerative conditions and to develop a new strategy for drug discovery in Alzheimer's disease and prion disorders. Dr. Biasini has been using the surface plasma resonance or SPR technology since 2008. In 2012, his lab bought a Proteon XPR36 system, which was used to investigate relevant biomolecular interactions in the research field of protein misfolding diseases, resulting in positive progress in identifying ligands of amyloidogenic proteins. In today's webinar, he will share some interesting work about a new generation of anti-amyloid beta peptides derived from the cellular prion protein. During the webinar, you can type your questions in the Q&A box and send to me. I will hold the questions until the end and pass them to the speaker. Okay, let us welcome Dr. Biasini to present. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, first of all, to Byra to invite me to give this webinar. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a project that we recently uh, run uh, using uh, SPR uh, to characterize the interaction between the cellular prion protein and amyloid beta uh, oligomers. And um, thanks to Ruben for the nice introduction as well. So in the first slide, um, I'm going to uh, show you a schematic of, uh, of the journey that a polypeptide may actually undergo. Um, so from the uh, biogenesis of a polypeptide chain, uh, we have the um, assembly into the uh, secondary and tertiary structure, the so-called native conformation of a protein. Although in general pathological conditions, um, it may occur that uh, the native conformation of a protein may um, be changed to form a series of misfolded intermediates that may lead to the formation of aberrant oligomers, uh, oligomeric uh, assemblies of that uh, misfolded protein, and eventually uh, evolve toward the formation of insoluble aggregates, so-called normally fibrils. <coughs> 
and some of these fibrils are not normally accumulate in tissues under, uh, under their genic forms. So in this slide, I exemplify, um, I summarize several known diseases um, associated to protein misfolding and aggregation, in particular diseases of the brain, including Alzheimer's disease, spongiform, uh, spongiform encephalopathy, also called prion diseases, and Parkinson disease. The hallmark of some of these diseases are directly uh, aggregates into the brain tissue. For example, the formation of Lewy bodies, uh, mostly made by alpha-synuclein aggregates uh, that are associated to Parkinson's disease and other dimensions. Um, the um, accumulation of prodase, prodase K resistant aggregates of PRP scrapey, the uh, causing, causing agents of prion diseases, which cause also uh, vacuolation into the brain to make the brain a sort of sponge, and that's the name derived, uh, where they derived the name spongiosis, and also the well-known amyloid beta plaques that are common hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And during this talk, uh, Alzheimer's disease is going to be the main subject, although we're going to also talk about other possible neurodegenerative disorders uh, still associated with protein aggregation. So in these slides, I'm going to summarize what is known about Alzheimer's disease. Um, we know that Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common uh, dementia in human beings. And it is a disease that, no, uh, that today is affecting more than 5 million Americans, almost 50 million people around the world. The, um, the, but the uh, most um, important factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. Uh, and aging, in particular, in, increase uh, enormously the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease in humans. In fact, Every five years age group beyond 65, the risk, the risk of Alzheimer doubles. And if because of these points, uh, by 2050, um, there are, we are expecting 60 million cases of Alzheimer in the only U.S., probably roughly more than 100 million cases around the world. And these numbers are going to be a devastating effect on um, the economy of the entire planet, I would say. Just the national cost in the U.S. for Alzheimer is uh, roughly estimated to be 100 billion per year. From a molecular perspective, Alzheimer's disease is associated to the accumulate, with the accumulation of the amyloid beta peptide under an amyloidogenic form uh, of fibrils and form plaques in the nerve system, and is also um, commonly associated to the formation of neurofibrillary tangles of the protein tau. So in these slides, I show you a, a cartoon of how the um, amyloid precursor protein, or uh, APP, um, the processing, a processing of APP can lead to the formation of um, the amyloid beta peptide, which can then assemble into various uh, misfolded states. So the APP protein can undergo two separate pathways of cleavage, one so-called non-amyloidogenic that leads to the formation through an alpha cleavage of the soluble APP, and the other one, the amyloidogenic pathway, which is associated to Alzheimer's. And in, uh, at the end of these uh, cleavage, series of cleavages, um, the amyloid beta peptide is formed. This peptide, which can normally span through uh, residues 140 or 142, and the 1, 1 to 42 is actually the main uh, peptide associated to disease, um, this peptide can eventually um, be retrieved as a monomer, but most often uh, under um, these folded and aggregated states forming these um, so-called oligomers, soluble oligomers, that eventually can then um, evolve through the towards the formation of uh, amyloid fibrils. What we know today is that the soluble oligomers are most commonly uh, considered to be the toxic species along this pathway. 
The fibrils are a hallmark of a disease and can often be retrieved in the, in the brain of patients. But the oligomers, um, because of their nature of being more soluble, so diffusible, and re extremely reactive, are considered to be the species that really cause damages, in particular to synapses. And in fact, in this cartoon, I show how the oligomers, uh, we uh, uh, imagine the oligomers binding to several sites along a synapse. And in this other cartoon, I summarize what is known in terms of molecular interactions, interactions that the oligomers can undergo. Uh, we know that the A-beta oligomers can bind to several receptors on the surface of a neuron, including the NGF receptor, several uh, glutamate receptors, insulin receptor, and most recently, another protein has been called into question how to be a receptor for A-beta oligomers, and that's the cellular form of prion protein. The prion protein is well known for being a major player in another uh, form of neurodegeneration that I mentioned before called prion diseases. Prion diseases are very peculiar in a way that the uh, pathological entity of prion diseases is also transmissible. And that's called here, uh, represented here, the PRP scrapy or the scrapy form of PRP. So these, these aggregates can propagate by recruiting a new molecule of cellular prion protein, so the normal form, and imposing that uh, their conformation to the substrate of PRPC, and so uh, inducing the, the, the conformation change, and then for, uh, leading to the formation of more PRP scrapie. What we know in prion diseases is that uh, part of the toxicity is derived from just the binding. So PRPC is believed to act as a receptor, a toxic receptor, for pathological aggregates of PRP scrapie. And then we also know that as a consequence of that binding, PRPC uh, is recruited to nascent um, fibrils of PRP scrapie. What, it, what was really surprising um, few years ago was the discovery that an, uh, the A-beta oligomers can also bind to the prion protein. This is, was a study published in Nature by the group of Dr. Streetmatter at Yale. So in this scenario, we can imagine that the prion protein can really be a, a normal factor at the cross of, uh, of, of several diseases by acting as a toxic receptor for several aggregates. And I will show you later in this presentation how we now, uh, we are now starting to believe that other proteins, other aggregated proteins and misfolded forms can actually use the prion protein to generate toxicity. So what our group has been focused on for the last three years is exactly these possible pathway of, tox of neurotoxicity that include the um, binding of A-beta oligomers to the, to the cellular prion protein on the surface of nerve cells. Our approach was initially, from a purely biochemical standpoint, we were interested to characterize how the A-beta oligomers can actually bind to the cellular prion protein. And in order to do that, we started to uh, look at what was known at that moment. Um, this was the beginning of 2010 when we started this project. Uh, it was known that the two putative binding sites on PRPC for A-beta oligomers were uh, roughly um, located into the end terminus of the protein. The cellular prion protein can be uh, schematically uh, divided in two domains, a, cellular, uh, a globular C-terminal domain, which is now shown here as uh, uh, including three alpha helices and two beta sheets, and the end terminus which is considered to be unstructured and very flexible. Now, surprisingly, the two A-beta binding sites uh, that have been located into PRPC were apparently uh, exactly only in the N-terminus. What we noted was that the cellular prion protein physiologically can be cleaved to separate the C-terminus, globular domain, from the N-terminus. And the end terminus can actually be released into the extra extracellular space as a source of long peptide called N1, 
what is actually stayed. The rest of the protein that stays attached to the lipid bilayer through a GPI anchor is called C1. So our hypothesis was that the naturally occurring, occurring fragment of PRPC called N1 was actually the uh, part of PRPC and, uh, that binds to A-beta-rolimers. In order to test the hypothesis, we designed a very simple experiment of immunoprecipitation in which we uh, coupled an anti-meak antibody to magnetic dynabeads and then expressed um, in cells, in X293 cells, um, meak tagged form of the full-length PRPC protein or just the C1 fragment or just the N1 fragment. And then all of, all of which, uh, all of these uh, molecules, again, tagged with a meek epitope. And then we uh, mixed a -beta, synthetic A-beta oligomers to uh, cell extracts. And we were able to demonstrate that um, the A-beta oligomers were actually captured by um, full-length PRPC as well as the N1, but not the C1 fragment. This was also repeated with recombinant versions of these molecules. So what this experiment was demonstrating was that the, N, the N1 fragment is necessary and sufficient for binding A-beta oligomers. Knowing this, we uh, decided to apply SPR to uh, deeply characterize the interaction between the N, N1 fragment and A-beta oligomers. And at that point, we were already collaborating with Byron for using their system, the Proteome XPR. Um, I'm actually going to just summarize briefly the technology here. So the concept of SPR relies on the um, uh, ability of gold surfaces to uh, propagate information from one side to the other, the so-called plasmonic effect. And whenever there is a mass attached to the surface, the, um, that surface changes in terms of re uh, ability to refract light. And that, uh, uh, that refractory uh, uh, ability of the surface can be recorded through a uh, detector. And so in the SPR, that's exactly what we uh, detect, a change of mass at surface, as detected by change of the angle of, refractive, uh, of, um, of the refractive light. And what is actually really a virtue of the BioRed machine, uh, SPR machine, is that the entire, um, inter the entire set of interactions is actually um, detected on an array of channels. In particular, the SPR, the proteon XPR, has actually six channels by six channels. So it allows to monitor six by six interaction, meaning 36 different spots on the surface of the chip. So 36 different interactions. And this is very versatile whenever uh, you want to run uh, a biological assay, which you need to have uh, controls and experimental samples in parallel. So I'm going to be using these sorts of schematic of the array of the proteome to, uh, all the time to uh, eventually show you the design of the experiment. So in the first experiment, we decided to recapitulate our observation about the interaction between the N1 and A-beta oligomers. In order to do that, we immobilized uh, a meat antibody of the on the surface of the SPR chip, and then flow through full length N1 or C1, all these molecules, synthetic and meat tag, uh, as, uh, as well as uh, controls like the just the buffer in which these proteins were made, and PBST, which is the normal running buffer. So um, we monitored that these proteins were eventually captured on the surface of the FPR chip by the antibody, the anti antibody. And then we turned the direction of the chip and we injected A-beta species. In particular, we injected A-beta monomers, which represent a source of control because we're not expecting A-beta monomers bind to these species, to, to, to these uh, PRP molecules and also A-beta oligomers at different, uh, four different concentrations. As you can see here, this is the, uh, the nice thing with the BioRed machine, SPR machine, is that you can definitely analyze multiple conditions at the same time. And of course, we also injected 
uh, PBSD is a control. And what I'm showing you here um, is the result of these uh, experiments. We uh, demonstrated that uh, PRPC, full-length PRPC, as well as the N1 fragment, but not the C1 fragment, can bind to specifically to A beta oligomers in a dose-dependent fashion. And what is really good of SPR is that you can um, calculate uh, very precisely the binding kinetics of the, of the interacting partners. And this allowed us to estimate the affinity between PRP species and A beta oligomers. So we, we actually found that full-length PRP was binding to A beta oligomers with 30 nanomolar kg. Surprisingly, the N1 was not only retaining that ability and that affinity, but also having a, an improved affinity of roughly 17 nanomolar. Um, these results confirm what we obtained with the immunoprecipitation assay, and that is that the N1 is necessary and sufficient for binding A beta oligomers, while the C1 fragment is completely inert from this standpoint. Knowing these, we then uh, started to look more deeply into the, the binding characteristics of N1 and A beta. So in these experiments, we again immobilize the MIC, the MIC antibody on, on the surface of a chip and float and, and capture the N1 fragment and the C1 fragment on the surface of the chip with the probit controls. Then we decided to test whether our N1 fragment was able to bind A beta at different times uh, during the aggregation process. So normally, um, with synthetic A beta, uh, we, can may, we can start by having a fresh, uh, just really solved peptides, which is supposedly monomeric uh, at time zero, and then allow the peptide to polymerize, uh, the peptide to spontaneously polymerize, uh, and undergo all the, the process of forming um, oligomers, protofibrils, and fibrils. So we wonder whether the N1 was specific for just for one, one of these uh, assemblies, or was actually uh, binding more broadly different species. And in this experiment, then, we uh, collected samples along the polymerization of A-beta and inject them directly into the SPR machine and tested their binding to N1, having the C1 as a negative control. What we found uh, was that the N1 is extremely selective for a particular assembly appearing after four hours of the polymerization of the A-beta peptide. And the binding was actually uh, already uh, apparent at two hours, was already evident at two hours, and also decreased at six hours. And this is pro uh, we, our interpretation of these results is that we know that there is a small amount of oligomers present at two hours already, and, the, and there is still few oligomers at six hours, where, where most of the A beta is actually under protofibrils. But at four hours, when, where we, we knew from other experiments of the procedure of uh, um, atomic force microscopy, we knew that at four hours we reached the highest concentration of any beta oligomers. That was exactly the time at which N1 was showing higher binding. So these experiments are uh, demonstrating that N1 is selective for A beta oligomers essentially. We uh, also uh, corroborated this evidence by running another kind of experiment uh, that relies on the property of this molecule called thioflavin, thioflavin T, or THT. This molecule is, has an affinity for beta sheets rich proteins, and in particular for beta stacks, which are characteristics of fibrils, of amyloid fibrils. In fact, is one of the criteria for discriminating amyloid fibrils from non-specific aggregation. And what we know is that uh, when we polymerize the A-beta peptide uh, in, in, into amyloid fibrils, the signal, the birefringent, so the um, property of thioflavin to bind uh, these species can be monitored very easily. And the signal goes to plateau when the thioflavin uh, 
uh, bind to A beta uh, fibrils because at that point there is a sort of saturation point of the binding because the fibrils do not evolve anymore. While the signal is actually in the exponential phase uh, in the, uh, during the time in which we believe the oligomers are appearing because the oligomers are extremely reactive and dynamic, so they are changing the properties of the molecules that are binding THT very rapidly. So we decided to test the effect of N1 in these assays, and we started to co-incubate the A-beta peptide with uh, several con uh, raising concentration of N1. What we found was that initially that a low concentration of, of N1 changed the kinetics of incorporation of THT. And eventually when we reach, and this was dose dependent, and when we reach the highest concentration, which was two more micro, uh, micromolar of N1, we completely uh, inhibited the reaction at a point, so the saturation point was more or less equivalent to the beginning of the exponential phase where we believe the oligomers are uh, mostly appearing. So this confirmed that the N1 is selected for an assembly along the pathway of, of polymerization of A-beta, an assembly corresponding to A-beta oligomers, and also reinforced the concept that N1 stabilizes A-beta oligomers, preventing them to further polymerize into amyloid fibroids. So, you know, uh, I'm going to make some uh, uh, initial conclusions about these experiments. We've been able to verify that the N1, the main physiological fragment of GRPC, is necessary and sufficient to bind A beta oligomers. This, the N1 is actually very selective in, to, in uh, recognizing a particular assembly of A beta oligomers appearing after four hours of the polymerization. Uh, these transient intermediates can actually completely be prevented by the N1 to, the, to um, uh, further. Uh, move along the pathway of polymerization and forming the fibrils. So N1 is really an anti-A beta oligomer agent. Because of these last statements, we then decided to test the biological properties of N1, in, in, in particular in uh, preventing the toxicity of A beta oligomers in the biological model systems. The first one that we used was these, um, toxicity, the toxicity of A beta oligomers in hippocampal neurons. It is known that um, it, uh, uh, treatment of hippocamp mature hippocampal neurons with A beta oligomers induce, which we can actually uh, test by a simple experiment involving uh, Western blots, uh, detection of, uh, by Western blots of the level of synaptic proteins that are normally um, decreased by treatment with A beta oligomers. Um, we decided to uh, introduce N1 into this assay. So in this assay, hippocampal neurons are treated with A-beta oligomers in, absence, in presence or absence of the N1 peptide, and then we reach for synaptic proteins and analyze the levels of these proteins by Western blots. These are the results. We knew we analyze. We focus our attention on uh, several, on four different glutamate um, sub, uh, receptor subunits. The, in particular, two subunits that uh, form the AMPA receptor and two subunits from the NMA and NMDA receptor, and also on the postsynaptic density 90, uh, protein 95 or PSD95. Uh, these proteins were already known to be suppressed, their expression, their level in, in synapses being decreased by treatment with A beta oligomers, as you can see in these uh, bar graphs here. And then we tested the effect of co treatment with the N1. In particular, it was actually a pre-incubation of the N1 with A beta oligomers. What we saw was almost entirely full rescue of the A beta toxicity in these uh, biological assay. So at least in this assay, the N1 fully prevents the toxicity, the synaptotoxicity of A beta oligomers. We also had another assay available. Um, and this is, this is, all these experiments are, were actually done in, uh, in the lab of uh, Luisa Diomede in, uh, in Milan. The previous experiment that I showed you was done in the lab of uh, Luciano Borsello at the Modern Egg Institute. And um, in this essay, uh, Dr. Diomede um, treated uh, C. elegans um, with A beta, actually fed the worms with A beta oligomers. What it was already uh, known by work done uh, in, in the lab of Dr. Diomede, that the pumping rate 
of, uh, of, of the worms is drastically reduced when the worms are fed with A-beta oligomers. And we first detected no um, effect of the N1 uh, it's a recombinant molecule in, in, uh, in these assays. So uh, worms fed with N1 were not showing any abnormality in pumping rates. But in contrast, when we pre-incubated A-beta oligomers with N1, once again, we saw um, rescue of the toxic effect of A-beta oligomers. So knowing that these uh, C. elegans based assay is uh, uh, revealing a toxicity of A-beta oligomers, we can confidently say that even in this assay, N1 is a rescuing molecule towards the toxicity of A-beta oligomers. Um, the last and, and perhaps most important uh, evidence that N1 is an anti-A beta compound was obtained in the lab of Gianluigi Forloni by Claudia Balducci. Uh, Dr. Balducci is an expert in animal behavior, and she recently described a novel assay for detecting the cognitive abnormalities induced by treatment with synthetic A beta oligomers by using this novel object recognition behavioral test. In this assay, uh, mice are trained to recognize one object, which we can imagine is this, this blue object here, and their tendency to be curious uh, allow them to explore a novel object that is eventually inserted into the cage, which we can imagine is this red one. So normally mice will spend much more time on the novel object to explore the novel object rather than the old object once the novel object is inserted into the cage. But when the mice are actually treated um, with A-beta, uh, A-beta oligomers that are injected into the ventricles of these animals, then the animals uh, do not recognize the novel object anymore, and, the, and they spend exactly the same time exploring the old or the new object. So our interpretation of this assay is that treatment with A-beta oligomers suppress the memory of the mice for the old object, so that when the new object is inserted into the cage, the mouse does not recognize the new object as new anymore. So we, again, tested the hypothesis that cold incubation with N1 was able to prevent the toxic effect of A-beta oligomers on, on, on memory in this assay. And that was exactly what we found. The cold treatment with, A, with N1 suppressed the, effect, the toxic effect of A-beta oligomers in a dose-dependent fashion. At a 5 micromolar, we had full rescue of the toxicity of the A-beta oligomers. So, uh, to make uh, uh, conclusions about all this work, um, we found that the N1, by virtue of, of binding uh, the high affinity to A-beta and selectively to A-beta oligomers, this molecule is definitely an anti-A-beta agent that can block the detrimental effect of the oligomers on muscle contraction, as we detected in C. elegans, synaptic integrity, as we detected in, in the hippocampal neurons, and memory performance, as we detected by using the novel object recognition in mice. And the very uh, uh, final conclusion of these, uh, the, the so-called take-home message, is that N1 may easily represent a completely new generation of PRPC-based therapeutic agents for Alzheimer's disease. And of course, now our intention is to develop, to use this information in order to develop real therapeutic agents. Of course, the N1 is a recombinant molecule. It's not really uh, easily suitable for, um, as a therapeutic uh, agent, as a pharmacological agent. So we are thinking to develop peptides derived from the N1 uh, molecule uh, in order to uh, propose them as a, a possible Alzheimer's therapeutics. Uh, in this slide, actually, I am trying to, uh, to uh, explain how the, um, the relevance of these results, not only for uh, Alzheimer's disease, but also for other, for possibly other neurodegenerative disorders. And this, is ba this assumption is based on the evidence, um, a recent evidence, that PRPC can act as a receptor for other misfolded proteins. So uh, we are, in fact, exploring this possibility by testing the binding of PRPC to other patholo pathological uh, aggregates. And if this turns to be true, then our N1 molecules 
may easily represent a therapeutic agent, not only for Alzheimer's disease, but for uh, possibly other neurodegenerative disorders that rely on misfolding, probably misfolding and aggregation. And the last line of this presentation is going to just show you what we are trying to do with the development of N1-derived uh, compounds. In particular, we're trying to reduce uh, the size of N1 by mapping specifically the properties of the N1 for binding to A beta. This was an offense that we, um, that we tried by re uh, reducing the, the size of the, the sequence, the length of the sequence between the two uh, predicted binding sites for A beta oligomers. So we uh, generated a series of peptides um, shorter than N1, and in particular shorter for the distance between the two uh, binding sites, which are the two extremes of the N1. And again, we relied on the proteon to analyze the binding properties of these peptides to A-beta oligomers in parallel. This was a very nicely designed experiment to analyze re relatively um, to each other the binding properties of these peptides compared to the N1. What we found was that the uh, sequence in the middle of the two, uh, separating the two binding sites for A-beta oligomers in N1 is important, but not fundamental. In fact, by reducing, uh, of course, we observed that reducing progressively the size of the of the uh, sequence between the two the two binding sites also reduced the binding properties of the N1 derived peptides to A beta oligomers, as shown in this graph. But also, we observed that there is some sort of, some some degree of um, uh, ability of these mo of some of these molecules, for example, for the P P1 peptide, to attain the, pro the binding properties to A beta. So what we believe is that by manipulating further the, se the sequence, we may uh, come, uh, reach the generation of a new synthetic peptide that may retain the ability to bind A beta oligomers at high affinity. This was the last slide, um, and after this, I just have to thank all the people that participated in this study. If you want to have more details about this study, you can read our paper just published on JBC a few, uh, two months ago. Uh, and uh, this, this work uh, is uh, um, a very strong, uh, a very classical example of good, good collaboration between different groups. One in Boston, led by Dr. David Harris at Boston University, and Brian Fluerty, an outstanding PhD student, is mainly responsible for the analysis, the SPR analysis that we have done uh, in Boston. Uh, but also people in, at the Modern Agri Institute in Milan, Dr. Marco Gobi is actually uh, the one that introduced me to the technology, to SPR. He's a, a renowned expert in, uh, for the use of SPR, in particular for studying protein misfolding. Matteo Stravalacci is a PhD student in his lab. I already mentioned it, Dr. Tiziana Porcello and Alessandra uh, Sklip for their work on hippocampal neurons, Luisa Diomede for um, the data on C. elegans, Lapo Gianluigi Forloni, and in particular Claudia Balducci for the behavioral analysis. Pietro Lavitola is a student uh, working with Claudia. Then uh, the lab of Dr. Mario Salmona. Uh, the name of uh, Laura Colombo and Massimo Messa for the uh, synthesis of A-beta. And of course, I thank you all for your attention. Great. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Emiliano. It is really, really uh, impressive. Let us open the floor to take questions. Again, you may type your questions in the Q&A box, and I will pass them to Dr. Biasini. So we already have a couple questions came in. So Emiliano, uh, the first question is, is there any clinical incidence observed where both the proteins amyloid beta and PRP are found to be aggregated in Alzheimer's patients or prion disease patients? Well, the, so one, one thing to clarify is that we don't believe that the prion protein uh, co-aggregates with A beta oligomers. What we believe is the role of the prion protein is a signaling receptor. So a receptor that eventually delivers a signal from the surface surface 
uh, a signal derived from the ABA universe. Uh, there are a few studies that address the involvement. These are actually old studies made, published well before the uh, description of the interaction by Dr. Streetmother in 2009. The studies I'm referring about uh, are, uh, are done in the 90s or at the beginning of 2000. These studies address the possible involvement of, of the prion protein from a, a, like a, a, like an, a genetic perspective um, in, in Alzheimer. And uh, I have to say that there's no convincing evidence that the prion protein is genetically associated to Alzheimer. There are studies that are claiming that, but also studies that fail to confirm that, that evidence. Uh, so what we believe is that the prion protein really doesn't, doesn't have a role in the aggregation. It has a role at a functional level in delivering signals from the, the, the nerve cells. Great. Okay. So next question is, how can you accurately determine the concentration of A-beta oligomers during the SPR experiment so that you can measure kinetics and affinity? What was the model you used for data fitting? Um, I'm not sure uh, which um, uh, which model is refer um, which experiment in particular we're referring to. I will actually, uh, since we have done a fair amount of uh, um, of interaction studies using the SPR, I will simply refer these questions. The, the, the person that asked this question to look into the paper. We we are describing each single experiment, which kind of model feeding we use. In general, we rely on the feeding uh, models that the uh, software provided by Byrad um, allow. So uh, all those, but but all the um, the details of those feedings are reported into the paper, and we actually use different models sometimes for different experiments. I see. And then uh, how do you determine the concentration of A-beta oligomers? This is a very good question. The, um, it's actually a sort of a problem for the entire um, uh, field, I would say, of study of the A-beta oligomers. Because we, what we can do and what we have done here is to calculate the concentration of A-beta oligomers um, based on the initial concentration of the single monomers, which of course is not correct because the oligomers are a different assembly. So one single particle of oligomers includes several molecules of monomers, and so the concentration is probably much lower than we estimated. Uh, this is a problem because there's no easy way of calculating directly the, um, the concentration of the oligomers. Also, this is relying on the fact that the oligomers are probably a, a, a mixture of different assemblies. So there's really no possibility of detecting, of, of establishing one single concentration for one single particle in a mixture. Um, Although, I would like to point out that eventually our estimation of the concentration, as I said, is lower. So the real concentration of the oligomers is most certainly lower by at least one order of magnitude, because we know that oligomers can easily be of 5, 10, or 50, incorporating 5, uh, 10, or 50 monomers. Um, this simple uh, information actually is calling into question the, the affinity that we calculated. Uh, in particular, the affinity is probably much lower than we, than we uh, calculated because the concentration of the oligomers is much lower. So eventually, our data uh, are an underestimation of the real affinity occurring between PRPC and ABA oligomers. Okay, I see. Yeah, so uh, as you described, as you compare all the data you, at, at the same, using the same method, I think the data are still uh, Meaningful, I mean, very meaningful, just to to describe the uh, the, the binding affinity. Although the 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 yeah, eventually are even absolute value might be yeah yeah eventually are, are actually even more meaningful. That's what I'm saying. Uh, it's uh, I mean, not being able to establish a, uh, an essay for calculating exactly the concentration of a beta oligomers. What can I, what I can say is that the affinity is that one that we reported, or actually much lower than that. So it's a much higher affinity. The number is much lower than that. And that will actually uh, will, will make the things even in a better shape. I mean, the possibility that one 
uh, could be an MTA data agent would be even reinforced. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, next question is, both proteins N1 and A-beta are also involved in copper binding. Do you think it has anything to do with your observation, especially in the context of last slide, where deleting copper binding sites, 50 to 94, lead to decrease in binding of N1 to amyloid beta oligomers? This is another excellent question. So uh, PRPC is well known for having binding sites into its ter and terminus for copper. In fact, uh, and this is actually mainly um, located into the octa-repeat region of PRPC, uh, repeats of nine amino acids uh, into the end terminus of the protein between amino acid 50 and amino acid 90. Um, so the role of copper for, for the function of, prion, of the prion protein is still uncertain. We know undoubtedly that the prion protein binds copper. We don't know exactly what, what that binding means. For a beta, um, what we know is that, uh, as correctly pointed out by, by the person that asked that question, we know that by removing the region of the octal repeats, uh, decrease the binding properties of N1 for a beta oligomer. So that might, might suggest that the presence of copper is actually you know, contributing to the binding. Although, what we notice is that um, uh, 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 detecting the incubation between, studying the, the um, sorry, studying the interaction between uh, N1 and A beta in presence or absence of EDTA gave us basically the same results. So what we believe, so EDTA, a common chelator for a copper. So what we believe is that uh, copper is not directly involved in, the, in binding between PRPC and A beta oligomers. Although I have to say that we still don't have final answer for that question, so we're still working on it. It's still possible that in some way, somehow, copper, um, especially actually in vivo, uh, so in cells or even in vivo in, in animals, might actually be participating into the binding. Um, out for, for the moment, our in vitro assays are actually not, not suggesting that. Great. Thank you for the answer. And I have one question about the uh, SPR, the, the, the instrument, the technical question about the instrument. So I'm, we know amyloid beta or these uh, similar peptides, they're sticky, might be, might be sticky to the uh, sensitive surface. Do you do you any special uh, treatment down to the surface, or did you uh, make, yeah, you know, your running buffer uh, with, uh, like, some... Uh, uh, special ingredients to prevent the non-specific binding of the, uh, the, the peptides to the surface? Um, I ha so, first of all, uh, the, it's, it's well known that A-beta oligomers are very sticky, but um, I have to say that we didn't detect, uh, like, an unmanageable thickness in, in A-beta oligomers into the SPR machine, which means that when we right. uh, flow through uh, A-beta oligomers into an, an empty surface, we actually don't detect, in, you know, so much binding that will prevent us to detect the signal-to-noise to uh, uh, ratio. Um, what is actually problematic to analyze, and in fact, I, I, I should actually point that out, is the analyzing fibrils by SPR. That's also probably relying on the fact that fibrils are also big in terms of science. In fact, uh, we actually run, and this was when I was in, in working with Marco Gobi in, in Milan, we actually analyze amyloid fibrils, but those are posing more problems in the, in the experimental settings because they can actually be more sticky than a beta oligomers and represent more problems mechanically for the tubings of the machine. A-beta oligomers and certainly monomers are not posing those kind of problems, and I have to say, kind of surprisingly, we didn't have too many, too much problems on injecting these into the SPR machine. Great. So there's That's no particular buffer. Yeah, we didn't use any particular buffer besides the PPSD that contains a small amount of twin. Okay, I see. Yeah, twin helps. Yeah, I'm glad the surface chemistry works. Okay. Yeah. So. Since, since there are no more questions, we will end today's webinar here. So I would like to thank you all for attending the presentation and participating in the discussion. If you're interested in knowing more about this application, please feel free to contact me directly.
my email address is posted in the chat box. We will also send out a follow-up email through which you will find the recording download link and our contacts as well. So again, thank you, uh, Emiliano, for the great, great presentation and also uh, answering all the questions. It is excellent, I, and I think everyone has uh, you know, learned something about your research field today. And thank you all thank for you. joining us. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Depending on where you are. Forward. Yeah, thank you, Emiliano. You're very welcome. And depending on where you are, I hope all of you have a great day or a good night. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye.